Blackface! Oh boy, here we go. In case you somehow aren't aware, blackface is the process by which a non-black person does their makeup to make themselves appear like a black person, often to perform as a caricature of a blind person in theater or film productions. This form of performance is widely considered to be offensive by most people, including myself, as it tends to be used to paint an insulting picture of black people. Now for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the entire history of blackface, because then we'd be here all day. I'm also only going over the times where a white man impersonates a black man because Christ we'd be here all week. So, I decided to go through some notable examples of blackface in film, and for reasons I'll go into later, I will restrict myself to only doing American films. Well, let's get into our first one. Oh god, oh god, do I have to start with this one? Seriously? <sighs> Birth of a Nation is a propaganda film that came out in 1915 and is based off of the book The Klansman, written by Thomas Dixon Jr. that is about the birth of the KKK, a conservative group infamous for targeting, abusing, and frequently killing black people because they believed that they were the inferior race. Now, this film carries a frankly aggressive amount of baggage and is arguably the best case for how a film can inspire people in all of the wrong ways. Whilst this film is still shown in film school for various reasons that I will not be getting into, I feel as though it is important to note that this film is an ungodly amount of racist. It is so racist, in fact, that the fact that the film has blackface in it is one of the lesser offensive things found in it. There are so many people in blackface that I just decided to randomly skip to random points in the film and found an example of it on my first try. Another big thing to note about this film is that it is arguably the best and most famous example for New South Revisionism, which is a process by which historians make it seem like the Confederacy was the real victims of the Civil War. If you're looking for a modern day example, just look at the massive amount of people who still say that the Civil War is about state rights and not about slavery. You're welcome. And as if that wasn't enough, it is so racist that it was responsible for the rebirth of the claim that still lives in the US over 100 years later. God, we have to move on. Oh cool, we have a film known for something other than blackface. That, that's pretty good. The Jazz Singer is a film that came out in 1927. It's about a Jewish man defying his father's beliefs to become a jazz singer. Now, as much as many of us probably don't want to accept, this film does actually have a very important place in film history, as it was the first feature film to have recorded dialogue. Whilst films had recorded sound before this point, this time people were watching a movie in the theater and actually hearing people talk for the first time. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you, you ain't heard nothing. You wanna hear Tootsie? Toot, 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 toot? All right, hold on, hold on. Now, whilst this is an important milestone in cinematic history, it is quite a shame that it does predominantly feature the film star, Al Jolson, in blackface. One of the most notable being the now infamous scene of him performing the song Mammy in front of an adoring crowd. Now, that scene is objectively pretty hard to watch nowadays, as not only is there a man in blackface, but he also is singing a song titled Mammy, which is another offensive caricature of black people. Now that is undoubtedly offensive now, but if you look into the man behind the makeup, you see something interesting. Whilst there is plenty to suggest that Al Johnson was an asshole, he greatly supported the integration of black culture into mainstream media. For example, he attempted to have an all-black dance group perform with him at a time when black people were banned from Broadway shows, and he greatly supported the work of playwright Garland Anderson, which would eventually lead to the first all-black theater production. Does that justify the performance in The Jazz Singer? Probably not. Even though he did do a lot of good for black people at the time, I think it's gotten overshadowed by his offensive portrayal these days. Now we're getting into an interesting area of blackface in film. Soul Man is a film that came out in 1986 and is about a privileged white kid who, after being cut from his family when trying to fund his college tuition, attempts to acquire a diversity scholarship to Harvard by pretending to be a black man. Oh, oh boy, here we go. So, through roughly the 70s and 80s, blackface mostly seemed to stop being a thing in mainstream media, apart from being in satirical works. It would be used to reference the many stereotypes and struggles that black people face on a daily basis. For example, films like Silver Streak and Watermelon Man all attempted to show the struggles black people faced in America to varying degrees of success. Some worked a little bit, but ended up being offensive for a lot of people, and some, like this film, tried but ultimately fell flat on their face and managed to do no such good. This film falls 
flat on its face so hard that it's garnered a reputation over the years as being one of the more offensive films with blackface in it. Ah, that's impressive. One thing of note, this film is arguably solely responsible for killing the career of the film's star C. Thomas Howell, an actor who was in nothing but hits like E.T. and The Outsiders. And it's mostly because the film doesn't really understand how to make fun of stereotypes. For example, this film may examine and try to delegitimize many black stereotypes of the 80s, such as Prince, aggressive sexual predators, and whatever the blue hell this is. However, it comes off more as the greatest hits of said racist stereotypes. The film never really condemns these stereotypes, but just references them. Ultimately, it's a film that tried to be something profound, but turned into the very thing it was parodying. Oh my god, we actually came across a watchable movie. I, I'm genuinely surprised. Uh, shame it's the last one. Anyway, anyways. Tropic Thunder is a film that came out in 2008 and is about a group of actors who are portraying soldiers in an up-and-coming war film who are forced to become soldiers in real life when an insurgent group threatens their lives. Now, Tropic Thunder is pretty widely regarded as one of the better parody films to have come out in recent years, and much like any parody, it comes with its controversies. Not only does it have a character portraying blackface, but it also seemingly takes spot shots at mental illness from an outsider's perspective. You m -m 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 However, the movie doesn't do that, and instead of fire shots at the people who take pot shots at those For example, Robert Downey Jr. does not portray a black man, plays an Australian method actor who decides to get pigmentation surgery to become a black man for a film. Instead of laughing at the people who are black and mentally handicapped, they laughed at the people who laughed at the people who are black and mentally handicapped. I don't believe you people. Huh. What do you mean, you people? What do you mean? You people. Huh? I... However, does that make the overall practice okay? I would argue no. A single well-written character performed greatly by an actor in a well-liked movie isn't going to change the decades of offensive portrayals. Just because Taika Waititi made a really good and really funny Nazi satire in Jojo Rabbit doesn't mean that the entire Nazi regime didn't kill 6 million Jewish people during the Holocaust. And it's clear that many people still hold that statement true to this day about blackface. At the beginning of this, I stated that I wasn't going to sample foreign films. There were two reasons why, because A, Christ almighty, we would have been here for a month. And B, we as Americans are more than familiar with the struggles black people face every day. The history of the US is littered with the mistreatment of people whose skin color is different than those who have the power. And that rings especially true for black people. How much like the birds and the bees talk, parents of black kids have to give a talk to their kids about the dangers of the police. How redlining, a now illegal and widely considered unethical process, has still made it nearly impossible for black families to take out a loan. How white men with a lot of power have created systems designed to keep people of color as second-class citizens and treated as less than human for nearly 400 years. And blackface is merely another pawn in that whole scheme. How this process has managed to survive this long is beyond. And in some cases, the act of doing blackface sometimes isn't even the most offensive part of the film. The Birth of a Nation was a three hour long racism parade that gave the client a second chance at life. The jazz singer, whilst innovative for the time, used a performance art that many people consider offensive. Soul Man tried to make a statement about black stereotypes, but just became one by the time the credits rolled. And Tropic Thunder, even though not making fun of black people, still can't erase the long and rough history that it has. Hell, I didn't even go into the other racist stereotypes in film history. I could have just as easily gone through a list of the times a white man has played Fu Manchu, or how many times Rob Schneider has played an Indian man, or how the entirety of the film industry has treated Native Americans. And these practices have been going since Hollywood started. In fact, the money that Birth of a Nation gained was so much that it led to the creation of Hollywood. To put it into respect, if you count for inflation, The Birth of a Nation was roughly as successful financially as Gone with the Wind, Star Wars, and Titanic, if not more. And if I'm being honest, it all just feels so ironic. Hollywood these days tries to be liberal and inclusive and tries to improve its image. Yet it's important to understand that that very institution was built in no small part to the many, many people who decided to brush shoe polish on their face.